all loud and clear. Uh, my name is Bill Tubbs. I am a management consultant. I've worked uh, most of my career in uh, industries like oil and gas and mining most recently. Um, I guess I've done some data analysis, mostly in Excel, but uh, in the last five or six years, been trying to do something more sophisticated, uh, hence learning data science. Um, caveat, so I've, I've never entered a Kaggle competition. Uh, this is the first time I've reviewed one. Uh, I do agree it's a good way to get into it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm still learning. Uh, welcome questions, like to have a discussion. Um, definitely don't have all the answers. So this competition, um, chose it about 10 days ago. I, I'm interested in time series and uh, dynamic systems. So this I thought would be interesting and also recurrent neural networks, which the, the winning solution involves. Um, quick overview of the competition. Um, so basically forecasting web traffic for 145,000 odd Wikipedia pages. So web traffic is the number of people that uh, open the page per day is the metric, 145,000 pages. Um, the competition was eight months ago, last year. It was sponsored by Google and a company called Volion, which I hadn't heard of, but um, apparently this is a California-based investment management um, firm. Um, And uh, there are 375 teams entered the competition. The prizes range from $5,000 to $12,000. And the top prize included an opportunity to present at the NIPS conference. Um, I guess a time series workshop at the NIPS conference. NIPS is uh, Neural Information Processing Systems. Um, so that's high level. Um, what I'll do today is uh, go over the problem in a bit more detail, talk about the data that was provided, um, the, evalu the evaluation metric, because it's actually quite a big topic for this competition. Um, and then I'll show the leaderboard briefly, and I'm going to do my best to go over the winning solution. Um, I won't be going into a lot of detail, but using a lot of the material that the winner posted on, on his uh, GitHub and uh, just end on uh, some of the learnings for me. So at any point, ask questions. Um, I, I mentioned this, I think I described this well. Any questions about the actual, what web traffic is or what this, what this problem is? Matt? Uh, I'm curious, like how, what's the granularity of the time that we're supposed to be predicting for? Yeah, coming up. Um, so there's various time periods. I'll, I'll just go over them in a second, if you don't okay. mind. Yeah. Um, my first question was why? Like, why, why is it interesting to forecast web traffic? And I uh, couldn't find any information on why. <laughs> so I found one in the discussion forum. I found one person asked that question, and one other person answered. <laughs> Apparently, that's not that interesting. We're just all interested in solving the problem. But let's have a quick discussion. Uh, like my speculation might be, um, well, Google, why would they want to forecast it? Um, actually, the, the guy in the discussion group said maybe they're trying to plan the server capacity for the Wikipedia server. That would be one valid reason. So they want to see if it's going up or down. Um, this investment company, not sure. Maybe they're just looking for new ideas on how to forecast the future from the past. Does anyone else have any ideas? Let's try and fill the gap. There's a lot of people that, there's a lot of people with ideas, but I also have an idea. Like, doesn't it tell you kind of something about society and what kind of directions we're moving in? If, if we can kind of predict what pages people are visiting or what people are interested in? Yeah, did everyone hear that? That's a very interesting idea. Yeah, uh, basically, basically the same. Uh, it may be a proxy for things that will be hot in the future, so investors will be interested in that type of data. Right. Um, another guess is probably, you know, that Amazon has a different pricing for different servers located in different uh, point of the world, so by knowing that, they can increase the revenue of the uh, company. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, one thing would be depending on the number of visits that you have to a site, then the conversion rate, how much you might have for a sales site. If someone's buying websites and trying to value those websites, they want to see how valuable they might become in the future based on how many visits they've had in the past. Awesome, yeah. Okay, that, that's great. So plenty of good reasons. I just thought it was interesting that the competition didn't explain why Google and Facebook were presenting this. Um, so the other comment on the competition description is uh, forecasting future values of multiple time series is one of the most challenging problems in the field. I thought that was interesting. Um, why is that? So first of all, what is time series analysis and forecasting? Um, a very simple level, time series, I think everyone understands. So it's data that occurs chronologically in a sequence, right? One item after another. Um, and forecasting is trying to predict where that time series is going to go next and potentially out into the future. So we're somehow using the data from the past to predict the future. So yes, that sounds difficult, but not necessarily, right? I mean, if, we, if we're talking about something simple like a pendulum, and you know you got the data on where the pendulum's going, come from, where it's going, its velocity, it's easy to predict where it's going next, right? We can do that as humans. Um, but in this case, it's difficult, right? And what I think we're talking about here when we say time series forecasting is difficult is that forecasting the behavior of dynamic systems is difficult. If the, if the dynamic system is unknown or complex, it's difficult. If the dynamic system is very simple, it's not actually a problem. So the key thing here, I think, is where's the data coming from? That's the question you need to answer. What is the dynamic system behind the data? That's going to tell you whether it's difficult to understand and whether it's difficult to forecast. So in this case, what is the dynamic system driving web traffic data? Anyone want to suggest what that would include? Everything. So everything. Uh, yeah, pretty much, right? It's every human being using Wikipedia on this planet. And not just that, their lives, right? And global events. So I start trying to think, well, what could be driving it? Well, I guess once a, a degree program starts on a certain date, on a certain topic, then those Wikipedia pages related to that degree program are going to start getting some hits, right? So maybe there'll be a little spike in September in Western countries. But you name it, there's so many dynamics going on here. You couldn't build a model of all those people in their lives. That's the point. So this idea here is that the model's too complicated to use to predict the future, but we're still going to have a go, right? We're going to see if there's some trends in the data, um, see if we can learn some characteristics about those dynamics, and then use that to project. So that was my um, philosophical introduction to time series forecasting. Um, this is the timeline map that you asked about, so it is a bit complicated. There are two phases to this competition. The first phase is called the training phase, and you were given, the contestants were given um, traffic in, from July 2015 to December 2016, and asked to forecast retroactively traffic from January and February in 2017. They didn't have that data. And there was a whole, um, I guess, leaderboard going on there as people were building their models and testing them on this January, February data. At the end of that training phase, um, what was called a future phase then started. And this is what the final results were based on. So in the future phase, you were given a new set of data right up to September the 1st, 2017. And you're expected to predict you submit your algorithm, I guess, and then you, you're expected to predict um, traffic from September the 13th to November the 13th, September the 13th to November the 13th. So two months of data. And then um, 
so that data was released on September the 1st, and then you submit your forecast by September the 12th before the event, and then obviously everyone had to wait two months to, for them to actually collect the real data. There's no way of cheating, right? Because the data was in the future, and then they revealed the winners on the 13th of November. Does that answer your question, Matt? That confused me for a bit first. If there's any questions on that, shout out, because now I'm going to go to the data. Um, so if you're doing a Kaggle competition, you go to the website, you see some files. In this case, there's six files on there. Uh, a lot of those are big files, uh, 700 megabyte CSV files. Um, the subscripts here, subscript one and subscript two, they're just the different phases. So for each phase, there's basically three files. A key file, which I'll explain shortly, a, sub a sample submission. It just shows you what you're supposed to be submitting in terms of format, and then the training data. And this is what those files look like. So the key file, I think, is just a convenience thing for them to reduce the file size. They gave every page and every time period a key. So that's a lot, right? That's 140,000 times, however many time periods, a unique key. And um, this is just a key file that relates the, the page details with Oh, I'm on the wrong slide. All right, I was looking at the wrong slide, sorry. So there's the... <laughs> All right, there we go. So that shows the, um, the page there and the key. So the key's just an alphanumeric key. Sorry about that, I was looking at the wrong, wrong picture here. And then the data file, the training file, is the page name, and then here are the numbers, right? These are page views per day for each page. And your sample submission uh, looks like this, so it's just the keys and the numbers, the zeros here, but you put your numbers in there for your prediction, right? So that's pretty simple, and then you upload those files, and then you get a score back. Uh, Alexa. Submit a sum for the period? Microphone. You can repeat the questions. So. So you, you submit like a single sum for the prediction period? No, you submit your series, your future time series for each page. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. For every page, yeah. So how do you submit per day? I, I only see ID well, and each, and Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? The keys are different pages and different time periods. So there's 200 keys for each page. Okay. Something like that. It's a long file <laughs> with one column. Um, I just wanted to show that because when you're actually doing these competitions, that's kind of the thing you're dealing with. It's not actually important to the actual problem. So it's hard to view data from 145,000 pages. So I just picked randomly 10 pages, plotted it uh, on the screen. Um, First thing you notice is a huge variation in the range of page views per day. This is a log scale, so the lower grid line is basically one. Um, so these are pages getting one or zero hits, and it goes up to, um, what is that, 10 to the six? Can't see on my screen. 10 to the six hits. And I, I noticed a lot of anomalies in there. There was one page that got no hits, and then for four days it, it got 10 million hits. So the people in the talked about outliers. Remove the outliers. There's some bad data in there, I think. Um, so I did a bit of my own analysis today on this. I didn't do anything too clever, but um, I looked at the most common values of all pages. So if you look at the frequency counts of every value, they're integers, right? So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, or higher. Then the most common frequencies actually are the numbers 0 to 9. That's not, that's not a um, sorted list. That's actually sorted by counts. So the most common is 1. The second most common is 2. 
third most common is three, and I've summed up the frequencies there. So zero to 10 is 16% of all data. And I'll come to why I think this is important in a, uh, later. The median values are also interesting. They became a discussion point. So the median value per series, the most common was two, the second most common was three, et cetera. And there is more data, so that was page counts. This is so-called metadata, so in that page description, you had some embedded information in the string there, um, including the website itself. So there are three major websites, Wikipedia, commons.wikipedia, and MediaWiki. Most of it is uh, wikipedia.org, I guess, the main site. There are seven countries, although some of the entries had no, no data for the country. Um, there are so-called agents, so there's four agents, and if you notice the third one, it's spider. So spider is actually not a human. It's an algorithm that's going and looking at Wikipedia pages, like Google search algorithm does that. So I don't know what the numbers are there, but let's say 25% of these are not humans. And then there's some other information which I don't fully understand. Uh, things like file, category, special, help, commons, um, some other data that may or may not be interesting. So that's all the data there. Any questions on the data? Okay, so I imagine one time series per page, and I understand a page might be at wikipedia.org, and it might be in the German... How does agent enter into it? Agent is more about who was looking at the page. So I think um, all agents, it, it's not clear who that is. It's probably everyone. Mobile is people using mobile phones. Desktop is people using desktop computers. And then the spider is an algorithm. So I actually sort of have four time series per page? No, these are, these are attributes of each page. So these are additional features of each page. So well, any like page... Like the mobile version of the Bogota page and like the desktop version, is that...? Uh, maybe you're right. I saw it as more who's actually loading the page, but if, if maybe, it's, maybe it's a different type of page, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure. I, I think it's more about who's looking at the page than the type of the page. There's another question at the back there. Yeah, uh, do you have this information for every day? No, these are just per page. Per page, so this is a total for all the time. This data, yeah, is total number of pages out of total pages, yeah. So all these categories should add up to 145,000. Any more questions on the data? I think it's important to understand the data before we start looking at solutions. Oh, two more at the back. Uh, so just to touch on the question the guy in the front asked, uh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot your name, uh, but uh, you, were, you were describing the agents that we were page. So do you have like web traffic broken down by each category of agent? So for instance, if it was mobile views on a particular day, do you know how many Mobile yeah, views. You, you can do that. I mean, basically, this will probably help. If I explain where this metadata is coming from, it's just extracted from the string you're given. The string is called page, but as you can see, it has different components like the main web page, the agent, the date, and uh, in this example here, there's a thing called vote. Uh, that might be one of the markers. So what people are doing here, this data that I was presenting here, this has all been extracted from those page strings. And that everyone was doing this because the thought is that this additional data about the page might help you build a better forecast for that page. Bruce? Question from the live stream. I'm channeling Robin here. Uh, on the first the data slide, which is maybe not this one, I'm not clear what values represents. Oh, on um, this page? Yeah, this. Right. 
Yeah, okay. So values here is um, page views per day. So to create that column on the left, I flattened all the time series into one giant bucket and then counted the number of ones. So most common page view rate is one, one, one per day. And not zero, actually. Zero is on there. I think it's uh, yeah, yeah one point three percent was zero. I was saying it's like a bin and a histogram. It's like a more human. Yeah, it's uh, pandas dot value counts. If anyone knows that, <laughs> uh, histogram would have been good, but it, it would have been wide. So I'm more of a numbers guy, I guess. It's effectively a histogram, and I've just sorted the top 10. You're right. Any, is that it, Bruce? Yep. Uh, smiling. We got a smiling emoji. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, Robin. So now I'm going to talk about evaluation, because that's another thing you need to think about. It's not just doing what you think is the best forecast of web traffic data. You have to score well in the competition. And this was also a big topic from what I could tell in the discussions. The chosen metric that you are evaluated on is SMAPE, and SMAPE stands for Symmetric Mean Absolute Percentage Error. They simply give you a link to a Wikipedia page for SMAPE, um, which is interesting. Maybe the page rate for that page was <laughs> went up a lot. I don't know if anyone thought about that. Um, but it, here's the formula. It's basically F is your forecast, A is, your, is the actual truth value. It's the absolute difference between the two. And the denominator is the sum of the actual and the forecast divided by two. In other words, the average size of the parameter you're trying to guess. And then you basically average that over the whole time series. So that's all that's saying. Um, however, there's some issues with this, which people started to realize. I made this plot in the hope of explaining the issues, but let's not go to the issues. First, let's just make sure we understand it, how it should work. So if you focus on the green um, plot there, that's the SMAPE score for one prediction where the actual value is four. So if you, on the x-axis, you've got your forecast or your prediction. On the y-axis, you've got your SMAPE score. If you guess four, you get a SMAPE score of zero. SMAPE is the error, remember, so the lower the better. If you, if you bang on, you get zero. If you chose five, you're looking at 24, something like that. If you chose three, you're looking, looks like 26, you get the picture. The problem occurs when you get down to zero. If, because it's a um, percentage difference, it's like a percentage difference, when the actual is zero, which is the blue line, it doesn't matter it, what number you predict, you're either going to get zero or 200. If you get it right, you get zero score. If you get it wrong, you're getting 200. And I think that probably hurt a lot of people. That's why I did that analysis of how many zeros. If your number's low, any error's gonna be a higher percentage than if you've got a, a big number. And you've got these binary effects here around zero and one. So, yeah, there was a big discussion about whether that was the right metric to use. I don't know what the right metric to use is. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, if, if, for example, it's server load, then it doesn't matter whether it's a page with two hits a day or a page with 200 hits a day. One extra hit is the same server load, potentially. Um, so anyway, questions? Um, can you predict a fractional number of uh, views? Um, good question. I don't know if they rounded your forecast before calculating SMAPE, but certainly the actuals are whole numbers, integers. Is that, was that what you're asking? 
these are the actuals, but how about the predictions? If, if, I, if I'm not sure if it's 0 or 1, can I predict 0 0.5, say? Yeah. I'd, yeah, I don't know. I would assume you could put in 0 0.5, but I, didn't, I don't know the answer to that, whether that was allowed. Maybe they round it to 1, or maybe they do the calculation with a floating point. You need the microphone. I'm just saying, if you don't, if you're uh, hesitating between zero and one, you'll be better off predicting one because for zero, the error will be 200 percent, whether you predict 0 0.5 or one or 0 0.3 or whatever. But for one, you'll get a better prediction. If yeah, there's huge decisions to make around zero and one. That was my takeaway. If you've got a time series with a lot of zeros, you better be damn sure that you know it's a zero. Otherwise, you're going to get 200. But if it isn't zero, you're going you're gonna to get penalized with 200 if you pick zero. Maybe I picked a bad example, but how about if it's, if I'm not sure between uh, 1,000 and 1,001, probably the midpoint will be a better prediction? Yeah, no, if it's, if you pick, if you guess 1,001 and then the actual is 1,000, you're going to get a very low SMAPE score. Is that what you were saying? Uh, I mean, uh, in this case, 1,000.5 will be better than guessing either. Better than what? Guessing either 1,000 or 1,001. Or am I better off guessing one of the two uh, whole numbers? I don't know. Numbers? So 1,000.5, basically the denominator would be 0.5, and the denominator would be 1,000.25. It's going to be close to zero. So I don't know what the difference is. is it, can anyone figure that out? I mean, obviously, guessing 1,000 would be better, but <laughs> the, ch the question is is guessing 0 0.5, 1,000 and 0 0.5 better than 1,001, right? That's your question. Can I? I feel like we're at a. At a individual level like you're looking at a specific example we're kind of arguing semantics here it's it's like dollar or averaging over the cost, the whole series of data so uh, looking at one specific example is just it's like realistically speaking depending on one or the other yeah it's you're better to be accurate right? that's the point of the loss function um, but on this particular one I think that like actually to your point I think the other way um, it, it should be if you're if you're worried about one or the other if it's if it's one or zero I think you're better off going zero because that's you're you're not incurring as much of a loss at that point, but it's kind of further to the point of why they're using this function. They obviously designed it this way to to try to predict or to try to discourage people from picking zero or not picking zero if they wanted zero. I mean, I would hope that they would design it that way. Um, just kind of my thoughts on the on the cost or the function. Ken. I think this is a very good loss function, actually, uh, because um, if you are assuming that your number of um, examples are one, so you can't predict from one example, that's what gives you the 200. But if you have like more samples, it will normalize over time. So it will, it will like become, the losses won't be as hefty as it is for one sample. And this is actually used in like some chemical engineering, something of that. But not the smooth, they're like A, A, R, D, some variations of this. So it's used for those kind of tight bounds. So you're better off with this kind of metric than using like mean absolute error or mean squared error. So this is much better than using those. Okay. It gives you more tight bounds. Ken is an expert on time series, so I believe what you said. Uh, it, it's also got two properties which may be very desirable for this particular use case. It, one is that it disproportionately penalizes underestimating uh, with the special exception of a, a page which gets no traffic, in which case it very heavily penalizes overestimating. And if you read into that too much, you might think that that might be desirable for this particular use case. Yeah, that was mentioned. So the, the steepness of the curves you can see there, if you underestimate, you get penalized more than if you overestimate. Which, by the way, I mean, so 1,000 and 1,001 earlier, if we think about, like, let's say my model says 5.5, 5, 
I think I'm actually better saying six than five, because this is not, ironically, since it starts with an S, but ironically, it's not so symmetric, right? And actually, like, if we had to pick one or the other, we'd, we'd go slightly higher, I think. Sure. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I'm not sure about the, um, the floating point versus integer thing, to be honest. Um, so that's the evaluation metric. And then the final results, so um, this guy, um, his name actually is Sulin Artur. Um, he got a final score of 35.48. And you can see the other scores there. I'm now going to go into his solution, which he graciously presented. Um, he's a Russian guy. Uh, he works for this company, Deep Social. Um, I was curious about who these people are. Um, described as a freemium influencer ranking, discovery and AI driven analytics platform. Um, providing its 38,441 customers with in-depth insights into demographic and psychographic data of influencers and their audience. I don't know what that means. You probably, someone here does, but I think it's something to do with rankings on search. Does anyone know what that means? Sounded like Cambridge Analytica to me. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or even. So Ducky said it sounds like Cambridge Analytica, which uh, people probably know was in the news recently for not good reasons. <clears throat> um, so he talks about. So I'm now going to go into his design decisions. He talks about his intuition on why he chose his solution. Um, so he says the two main information sources for prediction, local features and global features. Local features, I think what he means here are features that relate just to that page. So if there's a trend in that individual page's um, traffic, then you expect that trend to continue. And I guess the technical term for that is autoregressive model. If we see a traffic spike, it will gradually decay, moving average model. And if we see more traffic on certain days, holidays, for example, we expect a similar pattern at the next holiday. So he's calling that seasonal model. So it's kind of like there's different types of models or different types of dynamics that he's thinking about using here. This is before he's come to his solution. He's just trying to think about that dynamic model and what could be important. And then global features, if we look at autocorrelation plot, which I'll show you in a second, we'll, he notices strong year-to-year -year autocorrelation and some quarter-to-quarter -quarter autocorrelation. So what is an autocorrelation <laughs> plot? Um, it's a plot. The autocorrelation value is on the y-axis here, and it ranges from minus 1 to 1, and it's the correlation of every data point with a data point in the past, a certain time lag in the past, right? And that's what's on the x-axis, is the lag between the data and it's the one it's being compared with. And so the frequencies here, you can see a big spike at, um, well, obviously there's a big spike at zero, because any data points closely correlated to the previous one and the one before that. But there's a spike here which looks suspiciously like it's around 360 something, which is the number of years, days in a year. He mentions quarterly. I can't quite see that, but um, it's in there somewhere. And so, I, in fact, I did a bit of reading on autocorrelation plots, and they are used in conventional time series analysis as a way of identifying the parameters for a model. Does anyone have any comments on autocorrelation? Maybe fill in where I didn't go into much depth. Bruce? Thanks. Just on the, the quarterly, I mean, if you look at 180 days, you see that in, uh, in one of the plots you have a positive correlation, although a little bit weak, and the other ones you have a negative correlation. It's a little unclear why you'd get a negative correlation over one quarter, but just observing that. Oh, someone's got a thought. What are the colors, Bill? I think each color is just a different series, a different page. Okay. I'm not sure. 
if you're Googling surfing or something like that, then that's going to become be a lot more common during summer and very infrequent during winter, which might be why you've got a, um, a strong negative correlation. Yeah. What I don't quite get, though, is if you're in winter, you're comparing with summer, but if you're in summer for the same series, you're comparing with winter. How does that come out on these things? Plus, there's northern and he southern hemisphere. Yes, but 90% of the world's population is in the northern hemisphere anyway. Probably. I'm certainly interested in finding out more about this uh, method. Uh, now I'm going to go into the model. So um, I'll explain the model, and then I'll come back to why he thinks it's a good model. I'll try to explain the model. So the model is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. And who here has heard of RNNs, sequence models, that branch of machine learning? OK, good. So still maybe just over 50%. Um, I'm going to try and explain this as if you've never heard what that is. Um, so first I'll explain his model here. So what you have is a sequence model on the left called the encoder. And then you have a, um, a state vector. And then on the right-hand side, you have another sequence model called the decoder. And basically, you're feeding all your historical data to the encoder. It's doing clever stuff with that and producing this state matrix. And that is being fed to the decoder. And that's, if you like, uncoupling that or unraveling that into a prediction based on the past. That's at a high level what a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model does. Um, but each of these components here, the green and the purple boxes, are a, uh, a recurrent neural network. So it's the same model repeating over time. And I'm going to give a simple explanation here of what, in general, a recurrent neural network is, and then come back to what a GRU is, because a GRU is a bit more complicated. But if you want to just think about a recurrent neural network simply, uh, most people are familiar with feedforward networks, right? Multi-layer, perceptron. Uh, you've got an input, and you've got the first layer, which is fully connected to the input. Second layer is fully connected to the first layer. A certain number of layers, and then the output comes out of the last layer. Well, RNNs are similar but different. Each layer, represented here by these four, this block of four nodes, actually has two sources of inputs. One, x is the input data for that time period. y is the output of that layer. But it also has um, this context vector or this state vector called a. And so you are summing up a and x. You're, you've got both of those together. The, ve the vectors joined. They're your inputs. You're producing an output y, um, but you're also producing an updated a vector, and that's being fed to the next layer. But the next layer is not a separate layer. It's the same model being run again on the output that came out of itself, so to speak. So in a way, the way I like to think about it is it's like a feed-forward neur forward neural network with many layers, but each layer corresponds to a different time period. And it's the same model at each layer, but you're getting new data coming in at each layer in the network, as well as a summary of everything that's gone, gone before. That's my best attempt to describe a, a, an RNN. The only issue, I guess, is where does the first A come from, A0, a um, because there's no, nothing before that. Usually, I think that's usually set to zero. I was going to say that um, I think you can think of that A vector as this sort of uh, hidden state of a dynamic system. Right, nice. So I like it. So <laughs> you're thinking you're going back to what I showed earlier, which is we're, at the end of the day, we're trying to model a dynamic system. And so, yeah, I like to think about it that way too. That's potentially all the variables, the state variables of the dynamic system. If it was a perfect model, you'd be able to go into that A vector and see how every human being decides to click on a Wikipedia page every day. Or, you know, it might be an approximation of that 
you know, maybe there's uh, one of the A vectors is, is it summer, is it winter, what day of the week it is, stuff like that. Thanks, Alexa. Yeah, that's a good, good analogy. And then once you've got that, you're just repeating it over time, right? Uh, on the input side, you're building up this, um, this model to produce that state, and then you're feeding the state to the decoder, and it's kind of using that model of the dynamic system to generate a sequence, a forecast, basically. The structure which you show it more look like the PGM probability graphical models rather than the uh, recurrent neural networks. At least, as far as I know, you know the pro as he, as he said, the whole like a hidden state and uh, HMM hidden Markov model and all the probability graphical models. What's it? I have not heard of a PGM. What's that again? It's a generalized form of hidden Markov model. The HMM. A Markov model? Yeah, the generalized okay. form, like the one, like one uh, higher level. Uh, and exactly that each state depends on the previous states and the input. And this, uh, like a state, like the weather forecast basically has been done by the uh, HMM, with the PGM, that like the, the current weather state is dependent on the previous states and some other. My question is basically, I don't get what, like the whole the training algorithm, learning algorithm behind the RNN here, even the structure of the RNN. I mean, this to me very looks like the PGM. But anyway, I'm not sure. It definitely sounds similar. Uh, it's certainly got an analogy with a Markov decision process, where I think you said it very well. The next state depends on the internal state and the new data. I have some um, from the hidden Markov models. Um, uh, the RNNs don't make a stronger an assumption of uh, the Markovian stuff. It's not too strong in the RNNs, so it's that's why it's better for some kind of problems. Uh, in HMM, those uh, Markovian assumptions are very strong, as, as some would usually say. So yeah, that's but the, all these are all generalized um, graphical models conceptually. Even a linear regression, if you you can actually draw it like a graphical model if you want. So it's like, it's just an abstraction. You can see there's an abstraction of those graphical models. Thanks, Ken. Um, so that's a simple RNN. The issues with RNN, as I understand it, are if you've got a long time series, and here I think we're talking 200 or more days, this is like a 200 layer deep neural network. They are hard to train. Um, they suffer from vanishing gradients, exploding gradients, and so they're not that easy to work with. Um, the other problem I understand is that you, it's very hard to remember something from a long way in the past. So if one, if say X1 on the chart there is a certain piece of useful information, that will be reflected in the state, A1, but then that state's being passed to the next sequence and then many more sequences, the effect of that X1 on, say, the output in 100, 100 time periods later is gonna be negligible, or it's hard to allow, keep it, it's hard to make it propagate a long way. So effects like, um, uh, I guess, this yearly effect might be diluted by this model. And I guess that was my segue to a GRU. So don't get too confused by this. I mean, I think it's too hard to explain today. But instead of a simple neural network with four nodes here, a GRU, just imagine that cell containing multiple things. So this green box here is going to be repeated. This is now the model that's being repeated every sequence. It actually has three models inside it. That's the yellow boxes there. Each one of those could be a neural network. And you see, it's slightly different terminology, but the H is the A vector coming in on the left, and then it pops out on the right. But it's called a gated recurrent unit because it has certain gates in there represented by those Xs. Um, those 
two networks there um, with the sigma notation, they are opening or closing these gates. And the reason that apparently works is that if that gate at the top is open, the state vector gets passed through almost identical to what it was. So in other words, the x value in that time period is not affecting the state. And so this allows a GRU to carry forward information over many, many time periods to influence a future time period. And I guess this makes them better at solving complex dynamics and easier to train. Conversely, there's a, the other neural network there will um, open up the gate when it needs to use that state. So it's like a memory. It's um, holding a value in memory for a certain amount of time and at a critical point, pulling that value out of memory and using it with the current state to update at a future date. That's, that's my high level uh, description. Um, so here's why uh, he just chose it. Uh, these are his words. So I decided to use a sequence to sequence model for prediction because an RNN can be thought of as a natural extension of well studied ARIMA models. So I gather ARIMA models are used in time series analysis and forecasting, auto regressive, something moving average, including moving average. Thank you. Um, is that, so is that true then, I guess? Okay, right. And so in his mind, he sees an RNN as being similar to that classical technique. Um, RNN is non-parametric, that parametric, that greatly simplifies learning. I'm not sure what he meant by that, but I think he means the size of the network, the number of hidden units is all determined pretty much. There's less uh, parameters than a, a deep neural network to decide on. Um, accepts any exogenous features, numerical, categorical, etc. cetera. Um, on that second point, like so in a normal ARIMA model, I think you would, uh, you would be having like coefficients on like these lag values. So like what was the value of this X like one time ago? What was it two time ago? So those might be alphas or something. So you end up with like this collection of parameters to fit. Oh, he's, um, right. So he's comparing it to the ARIMA and saying it's less parametric than ARIMA. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> Well, is that correct that non-parametric model has an easier uh, learning methodology? That's not something... I think he's just saying, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but if you've got less parameters that you need to decide on or values to choose, then you, you don't have to do as much hyperparameter tuning. You can start training sooner, right? But I think generally, as much as you have a less number of parameters, you end up uh, like a more happy life. I mean, when you have a lots of lots of parameters to tune, oh, yeah. that's my general understanding. But anyway, yeah, I, 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 if, if I, it's a difficult topic. I guess if you don't have enough parameters, then you might not fit a good model. But if you have too many, it's going to take a long time to train. Bruce is going to give the right answer now. I'm uh, sure. This is not necessarily the right answer, but my understanding is that. Non-parametric is a little bit of a misnomer because it sounds like there's no parameters. In fact, there's zillions of parameters, but it's what you were saying that's the more important thing. You're not having to decide how many parameters and exactly how they play into the model. It, it figures that out for you. So there's still lots of parameters, um, many more than you would have in a parametric model, in fact. So you're, you've got a lot of flexibility there to, uh, to learn the data. Can we continue? I still have more comments. We'll, we'll talk over beer, how about that? <laughs> how am I doing for time, Bruce? Because it looks like... Uh, uh, 20 minutes. Okay, I got, according to this, I got 10 slides. Um, what else is on here? So se sequence to sequence seems like a natural for this task. And uh, deep learning is all the hype nowadays, so that's a good reason to use it. <laughs> <laughs> no Bayesian, oh dear. Doesn't score well there, does it? Uh, feature engineering, so this is always an important part of um, machine learning. Um, so obviously page views, but he did transform page views. Um, log 1p, I think it's just a NumPy function. It means a log of 1 plus p. Um, 
to get more or less normal interest series values distribution instead of a skewed one. Um, agent country site, they're, uh, they're the parameters I showed you earlier. Um, day of the week, year to quarter, year to year, quarter to quarter autocorrelation. So some numbers from that autocorrelation chart. Day of the week is obviously potentially useful, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because people do Google different things on Saturday than they do on Tuesday. Uh, page popularity, so this is interesting. So a lot of people found that the median page views was a very explanatory variable. And um, I don't really know why. I wanted to look into this more, but I, I didn't have time. Um, it obviously, it allows you to scale um, your page in terms of total views, but the average would do that perfectly well. I was thinking it might be something to do with these low page views. Um, if you had a page where more than half of the values were zero, then your zero would be your median probably, and uh, then you would avoid that 200 score penalty for over half of your series, something like that. Um, that was just me speculating. It, it, it was, I, I wanted to do it, but apparently if you just submitted a forecast with the median from the historic as your prediction constantly, you did pretty well. I, I, I'll get back to you on the score of that. Question. Talk about the uh, format. You got a microphone? Uh, can you just discuss the format of the autocorrelation features? Uh, no, I didn't go into that. I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't know, because it wouldn't be one value, would it? I don't know how he parameterized that. Maybe he just, or is that what the year-to-year, quarter-to-quarter? Yeah, so he just took two autocorrelation values, the year-to-year -year and the quarter-to-quarter. -quarter. So, so they're just lags of exactly one quarter and exactly yeah. one year? Yeah, so it's every value's autocorrelation with its 365-day prior value. Um, lagged page views. I don't know what that means. I didn't look at that. Um, so he, he, he went down a rabbit hole here and then he gave up on it. But he had this idea of using the LSTM and the GRU to um, remember long time series, like remember correlations over long time series, like from one year ago to the present, say, or one quarter ago to the present. And, um, and this is possible with a tension mechanism. So a tension mechanism is a separate neural network that you apply that points, that gives more weight to certain values um, from certain places, so say one year ago, and feeds those, gives those more prominence than others. And basically, to cut a long story short, he, he, he ended up with an extremely complex model, and um, he realized that a lot simpler way to do this um, was to simply copy the values from a quarter ago and a year ago and feed them as input into the prediction, which is pretty clever, right? Now, the model has the one year ago value and the quarter a go value and it can decide if it finds it significant. Does that make sense? I, I brushed over that pretty quickly. But So training, so that was the model. I'm now going to talk about training. Um, training, the SMAPE, he said, uh, can't be used directly because of its unstable behavior. Near zero values, these would confuse the optimizer potentially. So he was looking for a different function to use as a cost function, and he looked at a bunch of alternatives there. Um, and he chose the blue one there, differentiable SMAPE variant, he called it, which is well-behaved at all real numbers. Bruce? Uh, this question comes from the, uh, the live stream, probably at least one slide back. Uh, the question is, is the input time series stationary? That is, is input to log 1p, the raw page view counts, or one difference, and or two normalized? What? Is the input time series stationary, was the question. 
Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question either. Robin, clarify. So what, what you might do <laughs> with your time series is um, calculate like the one-step differences. So if, I, if my time series is like 4, 4, 4, 5, I might turn that into like 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, and, and other kind of transforms like that. So if it was stationary, then all your differences would be zero, so it would not be interesting. Uh, no? Stationary just means it... Well, depends maybe, what you're looking maybe at. Maybe Dan can cover stationary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just talking about how it changes in time. So if there's a trend, for example, you subtract off the trend and, and look at the uh, the remaining time series after the trend is subtracted off. So Robin said, if you ask what the light is, say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He hasn't heard you yet. That's what you said. Good. You can keep that. I need a microphone for those people online. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's a big topic, but everyone used a different version. But the point is here, he's training on a, he's not using the actual final evaluation metric to train the network, because he doesn't think that will work. Maybe he tried it and it doesn't work. And he's training, he's training on something which is smooth and differentiable, but hopefully as close to the evaluation metric as possible so that his final trained metric, uh, sorry, model actually does a good job on the real metric. Ken. So uh, I've been having a lot of problems like um, getting differentiable versions of loss metrics. Did you figure out a, like a standard way where you can make this kind of conversions? Because this is actually key in a number of cargo competitions. Did you get some kind of hidden insight on how to convert like a, a non-stationary version or non-differentiable version to a, dis to a differentiable version like a trick, a clever trick? Do you figure anything out? I don't think I'm qualified. I mean, optimization is a huge topic. Okay. And uh, all I know is that you don't want convex functions. Um, I guess, ideally, you want them differentiable at all values because the derivative is useful. Um, in this case, I, it, the, the code is right there. I mean, I think he's just um, adding a couple of parameters to prevent it um, going asymptotic. Uh, note that uh, this blue line, it looks a little like some activation functions, right? And and it's not completely differentiable. They've done this sort of maximum trick. It's got that one point where it intersects the yellow line. But it's sort of it's OK, and just like it is in those more exotic activation functions. So maybe there's an insight. Um, a lot of people said MAE would be the best metric to use here. Moving average. Mean absolute error. Mean absolute, what is it? Error, right. But the problem is it's so far from the actual metric used that it wouldn't help, probably. OK, that's about as far as I can go on, on the issues of the evaluation metric versus the cost function. Um, obviously, what he chose did well. Um, this is interesting. So if, for everyone familiar with Kaggle competitions based on classification or stationary data, you are given some data and you break it into a training set and a validation set. You train your model on the training set and then you use the validation set. And you usually choose the validation set randomly. It doesn't matter, right? You can just pick any point from anywhere. But when you've got time series data, what do you do? It's an interesting problem because you're not trying to predict individual data points. You're trying to create a sequence. And so he explains it quite well. I think you've got two options. You can split your data in time, or you can sp split it in cross-section. So I guess to start on the right, I mean, that's most similar to what you would normally do. You would pick, say, 80% of your pages. The data for 80% of your pages you're going to use for training a model, and you're going to hold back the other 20% and just use them for testing. And then when you're happy, you're going to send your algorithm in to be finally tested on a separate set of data that you don't have. So, but here what he's done is, um, and sorry, yeah, and when you're, yeah, you're, you're, you've got to train the encoder and then predict on the sequence immediately after that. So they have to be connected. And then on, I might have got this the wrong way around, but on the left there, that's, what, that's what's happening on the left, isn't it? What he ended up doing was, uh, you have quite a long sequence in the 
of data, and he was taking randomly chosen sequences of length 200 and then just predicting from then. So it, it wasn't necessarily the end of the uh, set or, or, the, or the beginning or the whole thing. It was just a randomly selected component. Question from the live stream again. Is there a separate model for each time series or one model used across all series? And sort of a follow-up, does the model accept uh, plus output just or does it accept or output just one time series at a time? Uh, no, good question. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's processing all the predictions together because he wants to account for the global factors that influence all the websites together. He's certainly training them on all the data, um, but that would be a big RNN, to be fair, so I'm not sure. The question is, I think he's saying, are you running this RNN once and producing 145,000 sequences, or are you running it 145,000 times? I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer. Unfortunately, I'll look into that. Sorry, the cross-validation uh, methodology, uh, I think, would not fit to the time series because it just uh, mix up the data. The time series has a sequence, sequential information. I think I, I got the walk forward split. Definitely, like a window by window, he, he evaluated the thing. But I, I don't get the side by side split. No, I thought I did, and then I don't think I do. I get the walk forward, and that's what he did. So he picked segments of the total data for each yeah. page randomly, and then he just cuts the end off as for the validation and the beginning for the training. There's a question at the back. I think the downside of that is. You're, train, you're not training on the final data at the end of the history that you've got, and that could have more influence on the prediction that you're going to be tested on. But his, he explains it on the next slide. His argument is it's like data augmentation because you can pull these segments out randomly from the whole time series and get more variety, I think, than just, say, the last 200 days before the end of the history that you have. Does that make sense? There was a question. I think you can also do it side by side. I think you can split it into different pages, and then you take a subset of those pages to train it, and you predict on the other subset of the pages. So right. that would be what it meant by side by side. That's what side by side is. OK, thank you. Yeah. This is his diagram, that's why I'm not very good at explaining it. Um, so training, he had a lot of issues in training. Um, so yeah, like I said, he, he chose the um, walk forward. Training trains on random fixed length samples from the original time series. Um, the code randomly chooses a starting point for each time series, generating an endless stream of almost non-repeating data. And he believes this helps with data augmentation. For anyone who's not heard of that phrase before, one of the problems with machine learning problems is there's not enough data to fully describe the dynamics going on. And um, if you can find different ways of cutting the data you have to make more variety, then your model is going to more likely fit the real dynamics rather than doing something unpredictable. So he, he was theorizing that because he was sampling data from different sections of all the data he had, that it was giving his model a more well-rounded view of what was actually going on. I don't know what this COCOB, C-O-C-O-B optimizer is, but that's the optimizer he used. Something to do with, um, he says here, it predicts the optimal learning rate for every training step. Um, does anyone know anything about what that is, that optimizer? I hadn't heard of it. Um, He's found it converges better than momentum-based optimizers. This is the problem that he's having, is that he's getting a lot of variance. Um, he calls it due to the noisy input data, but to me that just means this is a very hard prediction problem. You're not getting close to the real values. That's the issue. Um, variance, by the way, is the difference between the error on the training set and your future prediction. And um, so one of his problems was 
the random number seed that he was choosing to initialize his model was having a big effect on the performance of the model, which shouldn't be happening, <laughs> but does happen with these neural networks. So that was a problem. His solution to that, I'll come to in a second. The other problem was um, the, the training area was going down quite well, but then starting to oscillate, going up and down. And one technique that's used is called early stopping, where you stop when you get to a good error. And if a uh, validation error, and if, if the validation error keeps going up, you ignore that further training. You just take the model, you save the model at the point when the validation error was the lowest. And so here it was jumping around so much, he didn't really know where the best point to stop was. Plus, every time he changed around the number seed, that point changed, so there was no general rule. So I'll jump to what he did. So he, uh, he no. based... Right, um, I am not sure. I think they're just different runs of the same model with a different seed. Um, can you, so the, there's faint lines in the background. I, I assume those are the real, that's the real training curve, and then the dark lines are smoothed? Yeah, it's, oh, really? Is this so a tensor the variance plot? is even higher, yeah. Yeah, so actually there's a yeah. really huge variance. I don't know if you can see, there's some really big variation behind. Um, so, yeah, so the way he solved it was, go ahead, Ducky. It looks regular to me, and I'm wondering if maybe that's, no, oh, never mind. It's weird how regular, it's just weird how regular it looks. Uh, sorry, I got a question. I mean, back to the <laughs> several slides before. The SMAPE performance factor, his methodology, uh, get a 35 on it, right? Something like that. In the end, yeah. What is the maximum score of? Um, it's 200, bizarrely. But the thing is, if it's not more than the random, uh, basically, detection, then I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this map, and I'm not sure that what uh, level he, it, it has to pass till uh, we say that his, uh, like a detection is more than the random detection. That's a good question, and I also wanted to know the answer to that. So I would like to know if you picked zero for all your predictions, yep. what SMAPE would you what get? What SMAPE would we have? Next question would be if you pick the average for each page over its history, exactly. what SMAPE would And if that was 38, Eight. then you've got to wonder what's yeah. going on there, right? Yeah, and then, and then we, we don't need to take a look at the, all of his methodology as if... The, yeah. His uh, method is, doesn't pass that random exactly. detection. I think I'd like to have the answer. I wish I had the answer. But I think it's fair to say with 375 teams working on this, the random would not be getting you anywhere near 35, right? There's, there's something going on here, and they've, they've done better than random. But I, I, I've got a slide at the end, but you can't really see it. I, I, this is a bit of a sob story. Sorry, but I tried to run his code so I could build his model and then see his predictions and compare them with the actual data. And uh, it just ended up taking the whole day and I failed. So that's a whole story about TensorFlow versions, trying to install old versions of code that have now been updated and on someone else's GPU. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was uh, unfortunate. A uh, question from the live stream again. Do, these, uh, do those smaller oscillations represent it? 24 cycle, 24 hour cycle, I guess. That's an interesting question. Um, this, the x-axis is training um, steps, right? It's not time, so it's oscillating in training steps. I, I'm guessing maybe it's batch size or who knows, right? It's not time, I don't think. It's not time in the real sense of time. But they do oscillate, don't they? Um, this is the thing, right? That random stopping, he might have stopped one model at a huge error rate doesn't mean that that's error on the data he has. It doesn't mean that's the error on the future test data, right? So what you want to do is you want to, you want to stop, you want a model that does really well on your validation set, but not by chance. You want, you want to believe that it's going to do well on the um, competition organizers test as well. So you can't just stop your model you know, oh, you won't let me do that. 
um, you can't just stop your medal when you get to here. You go, wow, that's awesome, right? I got, what is that? That's uh, 0.35, right? Because it might be 0.35 on the test that you've constructed with the data you have, but then when it get, if you're getting this kind of variance, the chances are when you submit it, it could be up here, right? Since these are sort of training artifacts, maybe it's a behavior of the COCOB algorithm or something. Yeah. Who knows? And you know, when, when the random seed's playing a big role, then you know you've got problems, right? Just maybe uh, a small point here. Uh, the, the scale of these variations relative to the scale on the left is are actually, they look like small variations, maybe one or two percent or so. Actually, you're right. Yeah, that's not 35. That's 0.35. Yeah, this is his cost measure, though, so I'm not sure what that scale is. But yeah, it's not that big, is it? 0.35 to 0.358? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand that. These, this, these charts and all the text is from his GitHub, right? This is his view of what was happening. Um, so the way he got around it was he chose a region, a region on there. It's roughly around the 10,000 mark, and it goes for... 1,000, and he took um, 10 models every 100 steps, and he did that three times with a different random number seed, so he ended up with 30 variants of his model, and then he ran them all and averaged the, the predictions. So, you know, maybe not very scientific, but it was a way to solve that problem in his mind. Um, he also, this is probably important, uh, he used uh, ASGD, so it's stochastic gradient descent, but you are maintaining moving averages of your parameters. So each training iteration doesn't have as much effect on your weights. Um, and uh, he believes those three things were the things that made him successful, and when he combined them, got him a good SMAPE. So he, he said that his... SMAPE error on the leaderboard for future data that he hadn't seen was pretty similar to the SMAPE that he was calculating he was going to get. And that's a good sign that he's got a generalized model. Um, OK, some stuff on hyperparameter tuning. There are many model parameters that can be tuned. He used uh, a package called SMAC3 to automate the hyperparameter search. Um, and contrary to his expectations, hyperparameter search did not find well-defined global. Ah, sorry. Uh, it shows me the next slide. <laughs> Bigger than the actual slide. Uh, are we on the right page? Hyperparameter tuning. Thank you. There are many model parameters. He used SMAC3 package, but he found that he could not find well-defined global minima. So he couldn't find hyperparameter values that worked well in all cases. All, mo all best models had roughly the same performance, but different hyperparameters. Um, his, I guess he's speculating here. Probably RNN model is too expressive for this task. Um, so I, I wanted, as like I said, I wanted to get better insight into his actual predictions, but I couldn't get his model working. He, he made this collage of charts, and um, I believe the blue on here is historic data, and uh, the orange and the green is probably um, the forecast and the actual. I'm not sure which is which. Maybe the green is the actual, and the orange is the forecast. It's hard to see. Other way around. Yeah, you would expect the predictions to be less variable than the data. Um, so I'm very interested in what flat lines could do, how well you could do by just choosing a really good flat line because this model is so complicated. Like, how can you really predict how many people are going to look at a Wikipedia page in a year, right? Um, that's it, everyone. Um, just to wrap up, I... Uh, my learnings, I guess, is explore the data at the beginning and try to think about what dynamic system is creating the data. Just use your intuition. Um, I would like to, I didn't do this, but I would always like to look at traditional methods and how well they do before jumping to something more complicated. Um, 
yeah, so use your intuition to find features that could be useful. So the, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday parameter, everyone used that. Um, choose the right cost function. Um, so it has to be close to the evaluation metric, but it has to be something that's going to help the optimizer and not hinder it. And uh, in my opinion, the rest is uh, luck or magic after that, based on this. And I shared the learning about trying to get someone else's code working. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you were discussing about stationarity. Um, uh, most of these models are based on stationary models, like those RNNs and a lot of them. And even even if the model is not stationary, there's how you can start up your data from future engineering and to have that um, and with, the, with stationarity assumptions. So that's what some of those, like if, rather than having individual value, you can start things like vectors of time lag, like those um, time steps lag into the past. So those are attempts at making things stationary. And even from your future engineering too, you can impose stationary. Are you saying, I think, you, I think I understand it now. So you're saying that it's a stationary model because once it's trained, it's fixed. It's not learning during the prediction process of new data, right? No, no, that's not stationary. There are many types of stationarities. Like uh, if, you, if it's the mean stationarity, that's, there's a long-term reversion to the mean. And then if it's, um, there are multiple types of stationarity, but maybe this may be mean machine stationarity or other kind of stationarities. And don't strongly and weakly, so it's a long, like the PhD thesis on that. <laughs> I take it that was a comment, not a question. <laughs> So I meant um, from the way you start your data as inputs, you can actually impose stationarity even though the process wasn't stationarity, wasn't stationary before. Most of the models are based on stationary processes. So but, um, from the feature engineering, how you start things, the RNNs and other stuff, you're imposing stationarity. So that's what these guys were doing To Everything is stationary. So you mean that the model doesn't evolve? Stationarity, okay. We discussed that in BA. Okay. Yeah. I've just found another learning, and that is there's a lot more to time series than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Two questions. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible um, to go to those Wikipedia pages and harvest data from them and maybe characterize uh, um, what type of, um, of page it is and how they maybe related with, with each other, or that's against the rules? No, no, you're allowed to use all the data they give you, plus any other data you can find. Mm -hmm. So unless you can actually find the page view data, which hopefully they're hiding, you can do that. You can, I don't know if people did that, but you can provide your algorithm with any data you can find. Okay. And that sounds like a good strategy. Start reading the pages. Exactly. Extract some key features from the pages. That, uh, I don't know if anyone did that. It's a good idea. Especially because you've mentioned that there are uh, uh, various types of, of signals. Some are um, some have some periodicity, and some others are affected by the news, and some others might be more random than that. So maybe by uh, looking at the Wikipedia pages, you could sort of infer if it's a seasonal type of information or, or not. Yeah, but remember, you've got to build a model to do that. You can't do it yourself because there's 145,000 right. pages. So you've just got to pick what you think would be interesting and then find a way to feed it to your model and hope that it makes um, a connection between a feature and the hit rate. Sure, 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 yeah. There would be a lot of work involved in that. But I only looked yeah. at this model, and so I only know what he did. I don't know what other people did. Yeah. Stan. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, do you know if there were any like uh, issues with like maybe rigging this competition? What I mean is like you you make your predictions by like September first or something, and then I guess you're free to visit those pages yourself, right? <laughs> so so <laughs> you you know for which ones you predicted? That's how the guy won, of course. <laughs> Non-zero, for example. So if you know that you didn't predict the zero, 
you can just visit each of those pages once a day. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that is an interesting idea. Because, <laughs> yeah, you, you, I was thinking the fact that the, the test period was in the future is good because no one can cheat, but you're saying it lets you cheat. You can, yeah. you can never predict a zero and then just have a little bot that puts one page hit on every page every day. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. We're going to take these two more questions and then. All right. Ducky. So, so this is a comment from, from the web. A stationary time series is one whose statistical properties, such as mean variance, autocorrelation, et cetera, are all constant over time. Is that like saying, I'm going to go all the way back now because I like this. Is that like saying the model is fixed in time? It's saying that it's not really going anywhere. It's the same at all. Well, essentially, it has the same statistical characteristics at every point in the series. Yeah. Um, so if that's not the case for the series, if they, it is going somewhere, then you can transform it so that it looks like it's the same. And that's what they did, I believe. Well, there was one question at the back, and we only had two it's not left. a question, just to clarify this. Yeah, comment, question. Um, in, indeed, the stationary is a time series where you remove the trend. And you remove the trend by differencing time. x of t, it's always equal x of t plus k, regardless of what k is and the values. That's a stationary. Uh, OK. Thank you. So I just had a clarification question about the data because my understanding was they had a key that would not lead directly to the URL page. So you can't look at one of the data sets and then see that page is on snowboarding or something like that. Yeah, you can. Or you you can, can go to, these go to pages. specific. These are okay. real pages and uh, the URL, it's not a good example, but the URL is in there. So you would see... You, you can go to these pages. Okay, yeah. 